Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Lorenzo Kilgren Grandi, and I am the founding director of the City Diplomacy Lab. I am delighted to welcome you to today's peer learning webinar on Cities for All Bottom Up Action for Just Urban Development. This is the third episode of the Urban Innovation to Achieve Just and Sustainable Cities series consisting of five webinars co-organized by GIZ on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and Cities Alliance. The series is supported by UN Habitat, ECLE, the Center for Affordable Housing Finance, the African Union for Housing Finance, and the City Diplomacy Lab. The goal of our series is to foster knowledge exchange between urban communities worldwide and create a roadmap toward the World Urban Forum in November 2024. Today's episode is organized in partnership with Land Dwellers International as part of the Daring Cities Virtual Forum 2024, hosted by ICLE and the Federal City of Bonn. The focus of this session will be on how to imagine, build, and transform cities in a participatory way. The participatory approach to urban development is widely regarded as an asset for cities. It not only allows the evolution of urban spaces to be aligned with the needs and aspirations of, of all its residents and actors, but it also leverages and enhances their creativity, knowledge, and energies for the common good. However, such a participatory approach often runs up against the underrepresentation of large segments of the urban population, as is particularly evident in the less affluent and informal neighborhoods of the Global South. Not surprisingly, those neighborhoods are also characterized by reduced access to essential services and opportunities for economic and social development. Fortunately, there are many examples in the Global South that illustrate the positive impact of dialogue and collaboration between municipal governments, civil society, and citizen movements. Our goal today is to delve into the nature and impact of these good practices and their replicability across the world. Before we begin, allow me to provide you with some housekeeping news uh, notes. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recording will be made available online later. Uh, this is a highly participatory event. You will uh, be soon invited to interact with us uh, through an online platform called Slido and the link will be provided in the chat and via the slides. Uh, before that, I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce you to Suheile Farzana, who will deliver a short keynote presentation to set the scene. Suheile Farzana is a community architect and co-founder of Co-Creation Architects and Platform of Community Action and Architecture. Suheile is also closely involved with Asian Coalition for Housing Rights and the Community Architects Network. With Kondaher Hezibul Kabir, she received the UAI, UIA, sorry, UIA 2030 Award and the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2022 for the works uh, by the river in Jenaida City, Bangladesh. So Haley, thank you for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me with such a gracious introduction. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can you see it full screen, Lorenzo? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So we can start. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to share uh, my experience. And so uh, it's a wonderful uh, title, I think, uh, Cities for All, Bottom-Up Action for Just urban development. So when we say like bottom, uh, in the city structure, we have the, we consider the upper one is the local government or the authority. And in the lower, I mean, in the bottom, it's the citizens. And if you see the detail in the citizenship, then we see who are in the bottom. It's, it's the low income settlements who are in the bottom. And again, if you see the low income settlements, we will see different class system would be there, the economic uh, differences are there. So they are in the bottom. And also there is one gender and uh, age who are never in the decision-making 
from these communities in the city uh, city planning process so that they are the women and children. So when we can bring everyone in the same, same platform and make everyone equally important in the city making process, only then we can make it a just urban development. And when we are city saying uh, cities for all, I think we need to ask ourselves like, is it something uh, there is someone who is facilitating the whole process and others are participating or is it ours we are we are actually in the process we are making the cities uh, with all so with this uh, i i go to the next slide so uh, if you see our cities uh, in the global south most of the cities are actually very organic and growing spontaneously and people are anyway designing and making cities without the professionals so being an architect, community architect, I'll, I'll try to share my understanding how we can actually join people's process and grassroots movement for just urban development. So uh, 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 most of our cities are spontaneous. Uh, so the map you are seeing, it's a uh, city in southwest of Bangladesh, Jinaida. It's a smaller town. And the left is the city map and the right, right hand side, what we usually don't see is the uh, map of the low, we call it invisible communities who are supporting the core, the city, but they are quite invisible. So it's quite important when we think of planning the, uh, uh, we should denote the low income settlements in the city planning map. So this city, they started to ask, uh, ask question like what kind of spaces we want in our cities. And they started with, from the very bottom, uh, the low income settlements. And then they started grouping up you know, with uh, uh, different groups, elderly groups, cyclist group, activist group, photographic groups, children's group, teenagers group. And then slowly government came into the process and the, pro the professionals also I think there is a little communication hiccup with uh, Suheli. Suheli, can you hear us? Hello, Suheli, can you hear us? I think there is a little challenge with the communication. We'll wait a few seconds and uh, if... Sueli is not able to reconnect. We can, of course, go ahead with the second part, um, moving to the, um, moving to our uh, panel session and coming back to the keynote speech. Yes, uh, well, let me share it again. I'm sorry. Oh, welcome back. I'm back. Yes. So when we do the co-creation process, we don't actually. Sorry. Uh, we don't go to the field as a professional with any preconceived idea, you know, like we don't bring any line, square, cube, or any shape with us. And everything actually shapes and forms throughout the process. So the process is important. And we are engaged in the process, people's process, with our multiple identities. So by this time, we know, like, the world has seen what the low-income settlements can do. They can come together, get together, they save together because money is power. They can also... Uh, uh, gather database, create their own database, which is also a knowledge, a power, and they can uh, they can map together, they can plan, and they can design and build their own habitat. So, uh, and so the question is like, how uh, how can we uh, the professional can make ourselves meaningful in this process? So I think the best part uh, and the best role we can play is we can co-create with the communities to make their create their own negotiating tools. And then from there, we don't need to do many, many of the things because uh, then people can actually do it and carry it on by themselves. So the tools we can use is like community mapping. We can, what we are good at the architects uh, or the design, any design professionals, I would say, vis visualizations and, uh, database creation, settlement profiling, and model making. So these could be the tools uh, that can help them to have an engagement. And then they can go to the, uh, connect to the government, to the 
other entities, NGOs to uh, facilitate. And so from the very small, we started uh, with uh, Dream Big, the city. So they started with the city planning. And from the very small, they start to plan like how they can uh, move their face to the river. They have a beautiful river in uh, the city. And uh, so, uh, so they started to plan. So all the things uh, goes around that they started to face the re river, the roads uh, are connected to the river and they started planning like this. And so when we have a very common uh, image of our dream or because they have a network city, they form the citywide people's network. So the network has representative from all sectors of people from the starting from the rickshaw pullers to the street vendors, low income settlement, elderly people, business people, civil society. So they have a one common dream that is making uh, open space and uh, public space along the river. And when this is uh, there, they can uh, actually uh, actually can implement it. Let me uh, show like how, how they can and, and let them present in front of the city authority when they have the negotiating tool. I mean, the planning and the models and the cost estimation, and we can actually help people to do that and let them share with the authority. So this is so uh, in a cooperation process, uh, this is interesting, like everyone has their own role to play, but they do it collectively. So when the municipality was from the starting from it, uh, from the very beginning, so when they see like they can implement this uh, plan quite easily, they actually source fund and they started to build the platform uh, near the river. So uh, there is, uh, I think in the process, there is no separate rules how the local government can support. It can come from the beginning when we have, we have a big team because they are also in the team, the uh, government. Uh, they can actually uh, play their own part. So I think however we do the city planning, the process is the most important thing. There might be different outcomes from the process, different product, but uh, the most important thing is the cooperation process, which ensures also participation of all sorts of people. And people actually take lead to implement uh, these things. And we see many visible outcomes. We also see many invisible outcomes, you know, like uh, when the professionals, the design professionals are working with people, the non-architects, they, they learn to, uh, you know, build models in scale. And we also can sow seed uh, in children's uh, heart so that they aspire to become an architect. This has been uh, happening in our, our city. So to summarize it all, I think uh, the uh, to, when we look at like professional perspective, what can we do? The first thing is being present in the place and engage with people and place. Uh, so presence is very important. And we can organize these invisible communities it can be nature or the low-income communities through collective actions. So small actions are quite important and we should not do it uh, individually. We should work with networks. Networks is very powerful. It will always sustain uh, the process and we can always uh, co-create uh, negotiating tools and doing collective actions together. So if we have a uh, acquire a mindset of co-creation and we really believe like people can actually do it. We can trust this and let people be the solution. I think I think uh, we can ensure a just environment. Uh, yeah, so so I, I, I would love to, to tell it like, uh, let's build a city that will be cities. We can build the cities with all, maybe not of all or with all. Uh, yeah, so by this, I want to conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suheli. This is an energetic presentation, uh, giving us a lot of hope uh, for this uh, challenging topic. You you showed how to make uh, the invisible visible, and invisible that is uh, essential is constitutive part of uh, of a city. And uh, thank you also for spotting out the the role of professionals and local governments um, in in creating the condition for this community co creation and uh, engagement. This is uh, very much uh, uh, important because uh, uh, professionals, uh, local government officials are a big component of our audience. And I guess uh, this uh, uh, message speaks to them uh, in, in a very powerful way. So thank you so much, uh, Suheli, for your keynote.
And I would like to suggest we move to the icebreaker now. Uh, there, are, there are three quick questions we would like to ask our esteemed audience. And we are using Slido, this website you can access through uh, the uh, QR code that you have on screen. Also, you can access it through the link uh, provided in the chat. We'll allow you a few seconds to connect and uh, see the questions that uh, are being asked to you. The first question is, which country are you from? It's uh, to see where our audience is located. We know we have a registration a little bit from uh, all over the world. Uh, I can see there is a predominance of uh, Germany, South Africa and Spain come second. Oh, I can see Nigeria, Brazil, Italy, my, my home country, um, USA, Romania, France, China, Denmark, India, England, Namibia, Senegal, Colombia, Nepal, Bangladesh, of course, Norway. Wow, this is a very global audience. Thank you so much for connecting with us from so many different places. And uh, particular thanks to those connecting from the Americas. I know it's quite early there, so thank you for waking up very, very early to connect with us. Uh, uh, this is much appreciated. Oh, I can see Finland and Greece also joining in, Mozambique, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. And we have uh, a second uh, quick question for you. This is to see how much are you prepared on the specific topic of uh, today's discussion and uh, you're invited to answer globally how many people experience some form of housing inadequacy. You have three options, uh, 1.6 billion, 2.2 billion, 2.8 billion. You are invited to answer and we'll show in a second the correct result. I can see the most voted option is 2.8 billion, followed by 2.2 .2 and 1.6. And uh, well, we can uh, now reveal that the majority is correct. Well done. It's indeed 2.8 billion people across the world uh, experiencing some form of housing inadequacy. So correct uh, and congratulations to 56% of our audience. And uh, we have a just uh, last very quick question. What is local participation for you? Just please type in a keyword. Uh, we are very curious to see this um, emerge. What are your expectations? Uh, this is also useful for our uh, panelists to take into consideration in the panel discussion that is following up. Oh, I can see a number of keywords appearing, essential, peer, uh, inclusion, of course, empowerment, communication. I can see inclusive becoming uh, a big, uh, inclusive and inclusion, possibly summing up the two uh, are probably the number one answer. Empowerment, inclusivity, uh, paramount. And I can see a lot of uh, other topics uh, ranging from sustainability to involvement, social justice, community-led agency, uh, equity, ownership, uh, user engagement, and democracy. Well, we could definitely see how local participation encompasses all the dimensions of uh, what is usually referred to as a sustainable and just development and uh, well-being in, in general. So thank you so much. Uh, I can see challenging also, uh, emerging, of course. This is a, a challenge that we try to address, uh, getting some inspiration from our distinguished uh, panelists. So thank you so much to our public for this uh, uh, contribution. 
and uh, I like I would like now to move uh, to the panel uh, where we have the chance of uh, being joined by four leading voices from organizations involved in bottom-up action for just urban development. Uh, in the order, I would like to introduce you to Joseph Kimani, the director of Slum Dwellers International Kenya, who will provide us with insight on the key ingredients of locally led inclusive and pro-poor urban planning at scale, such as community organizing, community collected data, capacity building through peer learning and coalition building with local government and other stakeholders. SDI is a support NGO to Mungano Wa Wana VGG, the Kenyan movement of slum residents and urban poor, member of the Slum Dwellers International Global Network. We are also joined by Paula Sevilla Nunez, researcher at the IIED, uh, who will share with us insight from housing justice research and a project on community-led housing involving grassroots groups from Malawi and Zambia, intended as a feasible and effective policy tool to advance housing justice and to provide housing that delivers both socially and environmentally sustainable outcomes. And last but not least, we have uh, two colleagues, Naomi Flomo and uh, George Gley uh, from the Federation of Liberia Urban Poor Savers, follows, providing insight on the community-led vulnerable uh, sorry, community-led climate vulnerability mapping currently underway in Monrovia for inclusive adaptation planning. Folops is the Liberian Movement of Slum Residents and Urban Poor, member of the SDI Global Network. Welcome, uh, dear panelists, and I would like to start with a question to Joseph. Uh, it's a question about the how-to or what we are discussing today. In your experience, what are the ingredients of achieving locally led, inclusive and proper urban planning at scale? Thank you, uh, Lorenzo, very important question. And uh, thanks for being invited in this uh, uh, discussion. Yeah, in my view, the ingredients must and should include community being at the center. I would repeat that almost five times <laughs> on the list of five ingredients. Um, this so because um, like the presentation that was done uh, by Ciela is that a lot of our processes are driven by professionals, by the state agencies, private sector, ignoring community. But an inclusive process will require that all those agencies be involved, but placing the community at that center. Lorenzo. Well, thank you very much for your uh, answer. And uh, I have a very quick uh, uh, follow, follow up question. What needs to change locally and globally to achieve locally led inclusive and proper urban planning at scale? Uh, quite a lot. Um, first is the trust that that bottom up process uh, is important. Um, a lot of people get scared of community involvement. They think it's a tedious, elaborate, it has a lot of governance issues. So people get scared. I think first is the attitude that we must trust and invest on community-led processes. Uh, this by itself will ensure that resources are also allocated in those processes. Because at the global stage, a lot of attention is on the end product. People want to see uh, a, a defined house, people want to see a road constructed, people want to see infrastructure placed in the settlements, but people do not want to invest on building communities. These investments must belong to the people and the people must be en encouraged through the process to own them by in getting involved in those processes. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Joseph, for your answer, uh, very, very clear. And uh, um, I now would like to move to Paula uh, from IIED and uh, focus a little bit more on local government, the role of local governments. How can local governments support and build coalition with grassroots movements to achieve equitable and inclusive policies that are informed by local voices? 
Thank you, Lorenzo, and, and thank you for having me here. Hi, everyone who's, who's attending. My name is Paula, and I work for the International Institute for Environment and Development um, in the housing justice team. So uh, let me share my screen. I will provide a bit of an overview of the way that we look at housing and we and we um, the kind of framework that we that we want to propose with regards to to housing justice and uh, then we can expand a bit on on the role the local governments play in this and then some examples of of some of the bottom up <clears throat> um, bottom up mechanisms to really advance housing justice and and sustainable and equitable ur urbanization. So I won't begin with an overall context of the of the housing crisis because it was the initial question that we had. Um, in the icebreaker, but it's just to say that housing is more than the shelter, as we know. Um, we consider it an entry point into other economic sense that uh, when you access a home or where you live um, has a great deal of impact into whether you become part of the of the governance system of the city. And so it's it's very important and it has multiple aspects from security of tenure to affordability to accessibility. And so the housing justice framework that, that we try to put forward at IAD along with, with many of our, of our partners aims to tackle this perverse nature of current housing justice systems, which we describe with, with three E's. So the first is that these current housing, housing systems are exclusionary because they prior out of responses and decision making. They are extractive in the sense that they emphasize the exchange financialized value of housing over the use value. They're exploitative to both people and nature. And they are enclosed because they operate within narrow views that prioritize individual rather than collective aspirations. So the housing justice framework is a vision that seeks the transformation of housing systems to ensure the equitable distribution of, of capabilities to people. Um, what, what we believe a housing justice agenda is that it, it does is that it can translate a framework into policy and practice. And that's what ultimately we want. We want to transform these systems into, into systems that work for, for all people. And so we think about it in, in four propositions um, that we put forward in, in, the, in the paper towards housing uh, justice, which the link I'll share event, um, after my presentation. But there are four kind of propositions. The first one is anti-discrimination. So calling for reparatory mechanisms for those who have been historically discriminated and have accumulated a historical burden of inequalities that can be across gender, gender, ethnicity, race, class, tenancy status, migration status, sexual orientation, even ability among others. Um, the second proposition is radically democratic measures, democratic structures that recognize and support community-led non-speculative forms of city making. And in this local governments, play a key role in embracing, protecting, and supporting these radically forms, uh, radically democratic forms of, of housing production. And, and they can be they can take many forms, as we will see a bit later on. Um, the third one is housing as infrastructure for better cities, in the sense that housing can actually lock cities into unsustainable trajectories when it's done in an in inequitable, exclusionary fashion, and it can deepen environmental degradation and social segregation. So if housing is instead treated as a social care and reparative infrastructure, it can actually promote better cities that can flourish sustainably. And the fourth proposition is imagining futures, diverse responses that engage with the needs, aspirations, and practices of the world's majority. So that requires recognizing forms of knowledge and of decision making that actually take part, take place outside of the formal planning systems. So those are the four the four propositions. Since I was asked to expand a little bit on the role of local governments, I wanted to point back to a paper that IAD and, and others um, co collaborated on last year um, that contributed to, to UCLG's Global Task Force for Local and Regional Governments, because there, there are plenty of examples in which um, that, that demonstrate the power of local governments in embracing, protecting, supporting, and expanding democratic forms of housing production and management. And I'm not going to go into all the examples because there are truly, truly so many, but I encourage people to, to look at this, at this paper if they're interested in, in seeing some inspiring examples. But I'll provide a bit of a context into, into what this means. And um, 
this uh, this paper expands a little bit on the ways in which local governments can face the the current context of financialized response to uh, responses to housing um, difficulties in establishing uh, governance systems that are effective, efficient, and inclusive. Often, when when there are limited tools to engage with different forms of housing provisions that are not the mainstream ones, uh, for example, the ones that are community led or non speculative. And the fact that we often struggle with limited regulations or outdated laws that can complicate the, the provision of housing in an equitable fashion. Um, and of course, we also have seen the, the, the importance of local governments in responding to crises such as, as COVID-19. So there are three kind of three pillars of this framework and ways in which local governments can, can respond to this. The first one is, is the respect and recognition of housing rights. And, and this local governments are key in the sense of their, their proximity to the communities and in and, 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 um, um, in promoting that bottom up, uh, those bottom up approaches, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about from our panelists around the democratization of data collection, ensuring that community led uh, in, uh, enumeration exercises, mapping efforts are actually recognized and used and supported properly, um, but also establishing open uh, and transparent structures within the local governments to monitor the housing conditions, and and that can actually equip. Uh, communities to to respond. The second uh, area of action uh, requires responding to evictions and addressing exclusion and discrimination. It also requires um, obtaining the capacity to regulate land and housing markets and this can of course only happen in collaboration with other parts of the other sectors and uh, central governments and promoting more inclusive and responsive forms of land tenure, which are sometimes not the ones that, that are promoted in historically. Um, and so recognizing this other, these other forms of tenure that it can actually be more inclusive. And then finally is the fulfillment of housing rights in which local governments still have a role to play, even when they don't necessarily produce the housing, but in uh, which is one of, one of the ways in which they can do it in terms of public rent, providing social housing, but also supporting community-led forms of housing. And um, this is very important. Um, and we're doing at IED in collaboration with, with other organizations, we're doing a, a project around community-led housing. And this is a research and advocacy project in which we're uh, uh, combining case studies with of different countries, including Malawi, Zambia, uh, Brazil, um, in, in Europe as well, but then we're also doing our own research at IAD to understand what are the benefits of community-led housing, what has been documented around the benefits of community-led housing, and what are some of the enablers and blockers that both in collaboration with local governments and with, with other actors we can overcome and, and we can make sure that community-led housing fulfills its potential as a key way to address the global housing crisis. So. I can't I can't address too much because we haven't finished the project yet, but some of the key points towards which we're heading are the fact that community that housing has benefits at different scales. They have uh, benefits to the individual who engages in community that housing. They uh, they have benefits to the community that creates the housing, but also at the societal level and documenting those benefits are actually quite important and they go across the spectrum quality of life and environment social and economic inclusion but also agency empowerment and democracy however um this also means that community of the housing faces some enablers and some blockers in the sense that the context also can contribute to making community led housing viable or not. And local governments in this context have a lot, a big, big role to play, whether it's in the provision of public uh, land or partnering with, with banks and financial institutions to make sure fi the finances are available. And sometimes even just the recognition of these community led processes rather than the criminalization of informal processes can actually contribute uh, heavily. So I encourage you to, to uh, pay attention to, to our work. Um, and as we publish publish the work, we can we can make it uh, accessible, and uh, we will continue to mobilize our efforts with with uh, with our partners, including through uh, this uh, this platform, the Hub for Housing Justice. That that. Should, but I'll, I'll stop it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula, for giving an evidence of the importance of collaboration between. Uh, uh, research, the research sector, uh, and uh, practitioners. This is very important to uh, provide a, a comprehensive uh, uh, vision and tools uh, 
that can be applied and adapted and uh, um, directly uh, empowering local communities. Thank you so much uh, for this focus. And now I would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Naomi Flomo and George Gley from uh, Follups uh, to provide us with uh, an insight into a best practice. How do you work with the city of Monrovia to make sure your perspective and your knowledges are at the core of adaptation planning decisions? Okay, so um, thank you for giving me the audience. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here and hi to everyone. My name is Naomi Ewa Flomo. I'm from Liberia. Currently, I'm serving as one of the heads for civics mobilization in Liberia. So we have the Federation of Liberia Post Savers. Saving mobilization and data collection, which the uh, data collection and profiling is ongoing and George will talk about it. So the tools we use in Morovia are the ones we'll be discussing briefly. Yeah. The service mobilization and data collection, the data collection, the processes are ongoing now in Liberia. And the tools we use in Morovia are the ones we'll be going into with you. So um, we are presenting, George and I. So I will start and then George will join me later. Next slide. Next slide. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Naomi. Yes. Okay, so this, uh, the photo here is, um, is just an overview that we have no boundary. We as savers, we go into our communities and we establish our saving groups, no matter where, whether it rains or it shines, we go into communities and establishing our savings groups. It is from the savings groups that we establish when there's time for profiling and data collection, they always meet us established into those communities and then use the same savers to continue with data collection and profiling. So this image is just, is just to tell you that uh, we have no boundary. We can go anywhere, we move anywhere to establish saving groups. So we have the three coordinating teams and then we come together usually the savings, the mapping, and the data collection. So we come together strategizing on the way forward of our outreach and discussions. So through those means, we have been able to achieve and contribute meaningfully to our communities. So we have the profiling, the mapping, the enumerator, our uh, total figure for the slums and informal settlements under Liberia Country Program is 113. And supported and monitored the construction of 104 water okay. cares, six toilets, shower facilities, three fence wall, and two kindergarten annexes under community upgrading form, financed by City Alliance, Water Aid Liberia. And so the, the water chaos, we as savers, we are always in communities and then they use some of the members of the savers to sell in the water chaos as a means of supporting us or supporting our growth. So managing the water, the operations of 100 water chaos and six toilet and shower facilities as well. So while we are selling, at the same time, we are helping to manage the water chaos because of sanitation purpose. Um, so supported as the development of Greater Morovia development yeah. strategy in a national urban policy, facilitated community engagement processes during the in development of the gender responsive and voluntary Relocation guideline with support from HFHI 
under the Liberian Country Program participated in the eighth and ninth editions of the World Urban Forum held in Ecuador and Malaysia in 2016 and 2018, respectfully. So develop over 60, where are we? Plans. Sustainability is plan. For the operation of our kiosk. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so develop or assist sustainability plans for so operation of the water chaos. So we have different plans for the water chaos and not to, you know, uh, okay, so yes, savings yes. And, and savings and mobilization process. Yes, so the number of savings in now in Liberia, we have 302 savings groups comprising <clears throat> of 10,991 members. And we have the female to be 7,979 and male 3,012. So 200 savings groups were recorded as the total number of savings groups mobilized within 61 communities up to 2019. So there are 102 newly organized savings groups, 85 out of the one or two Savings groups have opened bank accounts for their groups and the process is still ongoing. So the mobilization team have visited 72 DOMA groups, which has been there during COVID-19 in the electoral process. So after COVID-19, we have our groups, groups of uh, 302, and then it became affected because of COVID-19. And after COVID-19, few years after, we came to our elections. And so now we are trying and we are visiting some of those DOMA groups and we have visited a total of 72. Next and process is still ongoing, next slide. So the images below, the, 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 the upper image is, is showing a community meeting and the right one is the visit from NGOs to the community. Below are the savings groups. And so the saving groups are members of the communities as well. So with the discussion, savings discussion, mapping, profiling, and then with the visit of the NGOs to our communities, it gives our people high expectation in terms of you know, maybe giving cash, uh, giving out, you know, uh, 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 maybe gifts or something, they, their expectations become so high. So if the expectations are not met, Sometimes it becomes a problem for us, the savers, the leaders, you know, in managing their expectations. But we have tried our best to manage them. Next slide. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have the leadership meeting, and we call leadership meeting to check up on the groups, to know the well-being of the groups, what's unfolding, what we go through and all of that. And we follow up with our strategies collaboratively and uh, the savings book sprinting, the trainings, dues payments. So those are things that we follow up on because um, without us following up with the groups, you see people will start to renege on payments of their own savings. And if they are not trained, they won't be able to do the work properly and also the dues payment, which is the UPF to the Federation to enable us get into communities to help with some of those problems that uh, we identified during the mapping and data collection. Next slide. Yeah. Apologies now, can I please ask you to come to your conclusions? Hi. Uh, Naomi, Hello. we are running a little bit uh, low on time. I wanted to ask you if you could please okay. uh, ad oh. address your conclusions directly, please. Okay, okay. So the achievements, what you see in the image is our savings groups. Uh, we, we save our own money and these are leaders have collected and brought to office for deposits. Some of the savings groups are into agriculture, and the lady you see in the video is also 
appreciating her own saving groups for giving her little loans because we are not able to go to bank. We don't have the requirement to go to bank for loans. So those are some of the achievements we have had. Okay, so to conclude, we like to say, uh, um, um, Apologies with our audience. I believe there are some communications problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Naomi. No, 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 no. Cut short uh -huh. your presentation. I, I believe it really did provide uh, evidence of the impact of uh, your work. And thank you. Thank you for uh, providing uh, this uh, evidence of um, how you can really implement the change. This uh, the, the, the lessons from Monrovia, they can certainly be applied, uh, adapted and adopted by other communities. Uh, and thank you so much for the work uh, you and uh, um, folk are doing. Uh, this is of great inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, I would like now to circle back to uh, Joseph. Uh, Joseph had prepared a short presentation. We are really short on time, and I would like to ask Joseph if you can uh, very, very briefly grow through your presentation, not uh, the initially allotted time, we only have around four minutes maximum. Uh, please, uh, 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 but we're very, very interested in learning more about your activity. Thank you, Lorenzo, really for circling back. Um, I To respond to the earlier question of inclusivity, we had implemented a project in Nairobi, um, which was basically trying to support slum residents of a neighborhood um, through which it needed a lot of innovation, I must say. So maybe I'll just go through the slides very quickly. Um, I will skip the general context of the city of Nairobi, which I know uh, most uh, participants may be familiar with, and just quickly say that uh, why this particular settlement was of interest for us is because they were uh, they are residents sitting on a uh, private land. Many of our advocacy work across SDI and especially here in Kenya started with advocating for secure tenure, uh, which was easy because the government recognized slum residents and settlements that are on government land, public land, but very little in terms of resources and uh, investment has been done on settlements that are on private land. So this was basically trying to provide a demonstration for that. Uh, next slide, um, please. Um, so it's um, it was an advocacy that required us to ask the city authorities to declare the neighborhood as a special planning area. Uh, this paved way for us to basically mobilize the residents through the planning approach uh, uh, methodology. Um, working with the stakeholders who included civil society organizations who are working in that particular area. The area had um, a population of, of 100,000 households. Um, and the area is called Mukuru. It have several issues given the nature of its tenure, uh, issues of access to infrastructure, evictions. And what actually brought our attention to this settlement is because there were numerous eviction cases happening there. Next, please. Uh, please, uh, next. Thank you, next. Uh, that's just the uh, a photo showing the densities uh, of these informal settlements and how difficult planning can be when it's of this nature. And I know like uh, the first presenter in the keynote uh, presented, uh, planning is difficult when communities are not involved. And that's what basically the question that the county authorities asked how are you going to mobilize organized residents who are living in this kind of neighborhood to participate in a planning process? Next, please. Please, next. Yes, I mentioned that. Please continue, continue. 
So uh, slightly before that, um, quickly to mention uh, this, the acreage area, we invoked our approach of uh, mapping every single structure uh, in the area. And we had even done a cadastral uh, survey to establish the tenure status because we had the issue of finding out who the owners are before we engage with the process. And later we learned that the state had actually the opportunity to continue and plan the areas to resolve the issue of uh, leaseholds um, that own, the owners were having. Uh, next, please. Next, please. <laughs> so some of the challenges um, involves um, with the residents living in this neighborhood, definitely one major uh, thing we established was the cost of living. Um, despite living in poor neighborhood, they ended up paying so much for water, so much for electricity, for every single services. And the state recognized that actually all this revenue was not going back to the state. It was basically being collected by a few people who are providing these services. And this was a problem we needed to resolve. Uh, next, please. So the, the whole approach was to look at how to provide infrastructure and the planning began by holding community consultative meetings. We developed a very elaborate community participatory approach by going to the household. So we ensured that our participants are not representatives, but every household participate in the discussions. So we clustered the settlements into smaller neighborhoods of 100 families. And in each of those 100 families, we ensured that there was a representation from every structure, every structure. A structure in Mokuru would have like 10 rooms. Uh, next, please. Next. So the planning process um, uh, had to be aligned with the county uh, sectoral uh, uh, departments. And this again was the other uh, component of ensuring county support. So we aligned our thematic areas al around housing infrastructure and commerce, uh, health services, water and sanitation, environment. So basically the county wanted inclusion of every sector of the city authority to participate in this process. So we did not just like ordinarily would work with the housing and planning department but ensured that every single department was involved because the issues were, were diverse and we needed to have uh, an approach that ensures that all sectors are involved. So multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional, um, to ensure that uh, no one was left behind. Uh, next. Uh, that's the model in which we, we developed to ensure that we got proper participation. We ended up with 114 community consultations uh, divided into neighborhoods of hundreds, which were 250 of those neighborhoods. Next, please. Next, um, please. Uh, that's just an overview of the area. Um, uh, and eventually we were able to present these plans to the city authorities who uh, implemented uh, some of the proposals that were coming from the community and uh, the following slides actually have the images of the work happening there. So please, sorry for quick presentation here. We were keen on road. Uh, just quickly to mention with the uh, planning of this nature, we were against uh, the adoption of standardized uh, uh, codes of the city, which required uh, so much of road sizes, of infrastructure space, uh, because it was ending up with displacing many people. And we wanted to guarantee no displacements during the process. Uh, thank you, next. So there you find a summary of the process of just community themselves clearing spaces for the development of their plans to happen. Um, next. And eventually the city government got in and uh, involved the community residents 
in the construction and opening up of the roads. Our bare minimum was to ensure that communities have connectivity to the grid, especially sewer and water. Uh, next, please. So eventually some works were managed to be done with the government, with the budget that they had at that point. Um, a lot more is continuing. The communities are using the plans to continue doing this work. We have uh, taken uh, good lessons from this process that now we are um, applying in other cities. Uh, we are working with the city authorities in Kisumu, other uh, towns to ensure that then we, we, we scale up uh, the lessons. Uh, thanks, Lorenzo, for that. And thanks for your kind. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, uh, for providing this uh, evidence on how to channel the voice of uh, citizens, uh, local groups, and to connect it to uh, uh, local authorities and making sure that the change um, is uh, shaping the life of, uh, of people. Uh, this is uh, very, very interesting. And um, also this last note that you mentioned on the replicability of, of this best practice uh, elsewhere. Um, and now would like to uh, open the floor to our audience for asking questions to the panelists, as well as to our keynote speaker. Uh, you will have the access to um, uh, the questions through Slido uh, as well. I would like to ask uh, uh, our uh, colleagues at Equally to uh, provide again uh, with the link in the chat. Uh, and um, uh, also is the, the link, um, the slide on screen, if this is possible, to allow for asking questions through Slido. Slido, it's a nice uh, platform because it allows not only to ask questions, but also to vote uh, for the questions. And so we will uh, be uh, answering questions based uh, on uh, the votes that they receive. Um, so I can see that there are already some question uh, flowing in. And uh, uh, once again, feel free uh, to vote for them. Uh, uh, and um, also, uh, if, if you if you can feel free to, to add um, the specific recipient of the question, if there is any, or if you prefer to leave it as an open question. Uh, I can see that we have... Uh, uh, a, a first uh, uh, question, uh, receiving three uh, votes. Uh, oh, this is related to what we just uh, heard. Uh, what kind of participatory method was adopted in Mukuru participatory planning project? Can you give us some more uh, details? Uh, Should I? Oh yes, go on? please feel free. Oh to yes, oh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so, um, city planning is a political process. Um, that's the way we view it. Um, we 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 viewed it as uh, political in the sense that you need to take to account different interests within uh, the locality, and in this case, for Mokuru. We had already civil society organizations working in those in the neighborhood with different projects. So we need to take to account uh, uh, that. We also need to take to account the different uh, interests of the residents. So we had structure owners who have invested by putting the structures. So we don't call them landlords because they don't own the land. So the structure owners, um, like in the case of Mokuru, are only 2,000 uh, who owned 22,000 structures. So you could tell the tension that was there, uh, the, the misinterpretation for them about uh, planning. The other category, of course, is the city authorities. And uh, the lead uh, person that we were working with was, was generous enough to tell us that to make this process work, we needed to bring all the sectors on board. So our first task was to create the urban coalition, a coalition of C uh, CSOs and the academia to come on board, and they had a role. Uh, the academia helped us interpret the research. Uh, the CSOs would take the different thematic uh, uh, segments of the planning. And then we had now the neighborhood um, organizing. Uh, we had over 400 community mobilizers 
who went down to start the mobilization and creating cells uh, within the neighborhood, cells of 10 households. And these cells of 10 households would then uh, converge to create the consultative meetings. So some of the planning activities like the infrastructure and housing required going almost lower uh, at the land level where the communities pass, you know, paths, and then bring everyone who lives there to participate in the conversation. So this was basically uh, the process, the um, civil society, the different segment, uh, like the water and sanitation, would look at the information that was available and go and, and, and start putting their plans and proposals through the consultative meetings. So all these uh, forums were consolidated to develop an integrated development plan for Mukuru. And that's the plan that was uh, sec secured for presentation to the city authorities who immediately saw the opportunity to implement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. We have a lot of uh, questions, very interesting. Uh, um, uh, so there is a, a question regarding uh, community-led initiative in urban settings influencing the adoption of regenerative, regenerative agricultural practices in rural areas. So this uh, urban-rural connection, um, I would like to open the, the question is not specifically aimed at one of our um, speakers. Uh, so um, who would like to address this specific uh, topic? You can raise your hand and uh, we will give you the floor. Naomi, you uh, certainly have a pre precedence because you your intervention was cut short. Um, would you like to address, um, I mean, you or George, uh, address this specific topic related uh, to uh, the uh, regenerative urban agricultural, uh, agricultural practices in rural areas? I think there is a little, so maybe a little audio con connection problem. Um, I, Joseph, if would I would like to address yeah. this. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, my experience with organizing is that um, some of us for quite some time believed a lot of work had been done in the rural settings. And we had borrowed quite a lot of practices from rural interventions and engagements. And um, until recently, when I realized that most people are scared of urban organizing. I think the challenge has always been within the urban setup uh, because of issues of governance, issues or many issues, the diversity of communities, um, uh, rural settings, there is a little bit of homogeneity in some aspects uh, that gives uh, uh, any organizer an advantage. Uh, urban planning and urban organizing becomes a little bit uh, uh, tricky, but that's what we've managed to do because if you focus a lot more on ensuring households involvement and engagement, it helps a lot. Uh, rural um, uh, communities have a lot of cultural elements that you must also put to consideration. In uh, urban, so the comparison is not as much as, as that, but the principles remain. That inclusivity, ensuring diversity, ensuring that um, the most invisible even within the community are given the opportunity. You don't work with those who are in the town centers of the rural areas, but work with those that are at the very end of the settlements. So for me, I would just say the principles uh, underlining any participatory approach would remain the same. Um, the context may differ um, in, in doing that. Uh, in doing that, I don't know whether I've really responded, but that's really an interesting question. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. And I saw, Paula, you raised your hand and you also kindly shared uh, uh, some information on, on the chat. Yes, so on, on this question, agriculture is by no means my, my area of expertise, but I do want to mention that when we talk about community-led housing, 
that often the activities around those programs or initiatives don't limit themselves to the to the construction of housing. Um, which opens up opportunities for uh, agricultural practices and innovation in that. And um, sometimes it's even groups of farmers or people already engaged in agriculture activities that can come together to create the community-led housing initiative or the other way around, that people that come together uh, for a community-led housing project can actually identify opportunities for livelihoods or for or for agricultural production. So there's that component as well. And and when you have communities organize themselves, even if it is for at least at the base uh, housing provision, that can also provide the space to to gain technical assistance and and to engage in a partnership, whether it's with with governments, with private sector, or even with universities, for example. So it's a way to to receive um, capacity building um, that can also be geared towards uh, regenerative agricultural practices, and so it can it can lend itself to partnerships of that sort. That can that can help communities both in rural and in urban areas. So that just made me think of that. And yes, I did share in the chat the information on the late uh, the last project. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. We have uh, several questions. Uh, I can see there is uh, one for Suheli. Um, let me take it. Um, can you explain a bit how these co-creating processes came into place? Who were the leading voices and how did the projects come into place? Thank you. Thank you for asking this question. So as I was explaining, like how the co-creation uh, process was like, it is nothing uh, you can decide uh, from in the beginning, you know, it will, it will start with something and then it directs, it evolves from the process. So. Uh, in the Geneva city, uh, the example I was showing is, uh, this is my hometown. So I came back here and Oh, Suheli, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so when we started, the city started to ask question like, what the spaces, good spaces can we offer to the city. So, you know, there were many groups who were doing it individually. Then it was a time when many started to ask the same question, they built a network. So I think this is the first thing, uh, all of them actually get connected in that. And uh, since I was there as well, we were there as professionals, we, we also started to contribute, okay, how can professional, we can uh, facilitate this project. Uh, process. So, so there was, it's a homegrown process. There was no uh, such project initially. Then uh, in our team, municipality was also there. So I was also explaining how uh, we can uh, have, play our own role, but we do it collectively, you know, in the same platform. So bringing everyone in the same platform is uh, the most important thing, the first thing. Then everyone can play uh, uh, their role. So the municipality thought okay this this uh, there were lots of proposals we were creating together with the citizens so there was no one author who led uh, this it was all it, it's the network so the community network was there the citywide people's network was there so there were a lot of projects and small projects they were coming up through this process so municipality took one of the uh, project uh, 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 one uh, it's two so it's two projects uh, he uh, wanted they wanted to source fund and they could actually have it and they build the first part then gradually uh, they negotiated with other NGOs and build the second part so it's it's it, you know it started but it's uh, not end yet you know so uh, it's it's in the process yeah and yeah so the project was not there uh, in the at the beginning. So it evolved from there, yeah. So this is again, uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and what I think what Joseph actually said, like the community needs to be in, in the center. I showed one photo where the community leader, she's showing how the plan uh, with the city plan, because the city had a plan to have a pathway along the river, which will intervene through their um, uh, settlement. So they were very smart to work with the professionals like, how they can replan their settlement immediately so that both can benefit. So, you know, when we keep the communities like the bottom, uh, 
uh, of the city in the center, in the heart, we can actually grow because this is the basic, very basic. It starts from there. And they are actually the people who are supporting the city. We shouldn't forget that. So we can improve them. Yeah. So I, I hope I can uh, I could answer uh, the question. Thank you very much, uh, Suheili. And uh, we now have um, time for one last uh, question uh, for uh, Naomi and uh, George uh, regarding uh, how are the saving schemes in Morovia linked to the planning work? Uh, please, uh, Naomi and George, uh, you can turn on your microphone. Hello. Can you hear us? Uh, please, uh, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, we're struggling with the network a bit anyway. So uh, my name is George. Uh, I'm here now. Yeah, okay. So uh, regarding uh, the city planning, Greater Moroni, as we know, it does not have a kind of uh, process that uh, develop more planning. And most of what is happening at uh, our settlement level is that I would like to apologize with our oh, individual savings group, me, and uh, we engage our communities. We plan to be necessary impact in the communities, but a kind of a national level master plan for our apologies, uh, of George. Uh, we cannot hear you very well. We don't have that in Greater Monrovia yet. And so most of what maybe sediment A does not have water, what the challenges are. Okay. Hello? Are you getting me now? Unfortunately, the audio Hello? quality is very poor. Uh, if, if you have another way to connect, uh, uh, please go ahead because they, we can barely hear your voice. Okay. Can, let's, let's try one last time. Uh, could, could you please uh, um, come to your conclusions for the answer? Yes, yeah, so uh, like I was saying, we in Morovia, our savings, uh, savings group work is actually at settlement level and we link them up to, uh, uh, to the, the national, the city development strategy. And so, in Greater Moravia right now, we just participated in the, the conclusion of a city development strategy for the next 10 years. And so we're part of that process so that our voices could be heard. And so, and all of these things happen at a settlement level, the savings, the data we collected, and all of the mappings that we did. So uh, one way we link that up is through the city development strategy. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, we are running, unfortunately, a bit uh, short with uh, our time, but we have now the opportunity to do one of the most interesting exercises of uh, this uh, webinar series, is to ask uh, our panelists uh, to uh, reflect on this discussion we just had and uh, make uh, the, the, the very difficult final comment on our conversation. So. Um, you will have a couple of minutes uh, to uh, present your final remarks, uh, taking into consideration uh, not only what your fellow panelists said, but also this uh, exchange um, of ideas with the public, the questions and the Q&A, including those points we were not necessarily able to uh, cover fully, but you would like to briefly uh, mention. Uh, so maybe we can start uh, with, uh, uh, um, uh, I would I would definitely uh, start with uh, Sue Haley, if you would like to give this very brief uh, final thought. 
Yeah, so uh, I think many of us actually uh, talked about the similar thing, you know. So uh, I, it's a feeling that it's a it's a time to do it like this uh, co-creation, like putting the communities, low-income settlements in the center. We do it with the people, not for the people. So it's it's a time to where everyone can you know participate and and be the active agent, not just participating. Uh, so we co-create together and we can say, you know, like it's our city. You know, we don't want to say like, we were part of making this city, but we want to say it's our city and we have done it, you know, and I see lots of examples like, like uh, the bottom are actually getting ready. They're they are actually ready, I think, because they have the capacity and they also have the power, power of money and also the uh, knowledge and the, uh, I think the database, database is quite important. And it's important when the database is with people in people's hand, you know, it's not in our hand and the database creation is done by the communities. So it's very important. Uh, and I, I, I have a feeling this is a time we can all connect and uh, we are saying similar thing. And the other most important thing I would like to say is the uh, I want to again second uh, Joseph like the attitude and I talked about the mindset you know like are we open to do it together and it seems quite complex true because there are a lot of people lot of ideas but uh, is there any better alternative I want to ask like is there any better alternative because we are failing in many cases we haven't like included people so it's there and if we can actually do that and we also need to acknowledge that we don't know everything uh, so we can gather this piece of knowledge from everyone and put it together so uh, and professionals involvement is quite important I think lastly because they can show it in visuals you know they can plan with the people and people I, I, I must tell you people have that knowledge and the wisdom uh, how they want to do it. But as professionals, we can organize those dreams and their knowledge together. And visuals is always important. So we can uh, do like that. So these three things, I think, uh, are the main points. Thank you yeah. very much, uh, Suheili. Uh, Joseph. Yes, um, agreeing uh, quite a lot with Suheili and all of us have emphasized the need for community involvement, engagement, and it can't be uh, anything less than that. And I think we need to uh, give hope and faith to community processes. We must ensure we promote co-production, co-creation, so that we don't have these old methods of communities doing 50 meetings and then getting stuck to present them to some authority somewhere. Why can't the authorities be in those meetings? So that's what we are we are we are we are basically saying. It saves resources, it saves time, it resolves quite a lot in terms of uh, what we do together. So it's just a very humble uh, uh, request in terms of dismantling the structural uh, frameworks that have been developed of holding ten stakeholders meetings. Then you have validation. Then you have now final adoption. All that, we can change that. Let's uh, circle that by having everyone in the room. And I think it's not an easy process, of course. And the Mokuru experience was was evident to us that it's not easy, especially when you plan for a neighborhood with vested interest. Not everyone will be pleased with the outcome. It doesn't mean that co-production means everyone getting happy. They are, you are dismantling the status quo. You are dismantling interest. And we must be ready to confront those for the public good. So that's all I can say. And thanks a lot for this opportunity. I recognize all of us in this space. Most of the partners involved here have also engaged with us in many ways. And we continue doing this. So it's just to say, let's keep the community co-production community, building our cities from the communities, by the communities. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh... Uh, Joseph, uh, Paula, uh, a very final short remark from you, please. Um, I, I wanted my reflection to be around um, the theme of time. Um, 
because I think time is one of the challenges that community-based initiatives face, which is the sense that these things are not built from one day to the other. Um, and that requires patience from, from the communities, from the authorities, from the partners um, and determination as well. And I think that sometimes even that doesn't mean the fact that things take time doesn't mean that that communities have to be complacent, but rather that we have to be ready for when the opportunity comes. So organizing is constant, even if action sometimes is not as visible. Um, and so so that's an important thing to, to consider um, for communities not to be impatient, for organizations to not expect to kind of copy paste initiatives without doing the, the necessary community engagement. And then I guess I would end on a call uh, for supporting organizations, donors, uh, governments themselves to actually patient funding and, and patient resources in the sense that you cannot expect results to happen in the short term, but but so many promising initiatives are cut short because funding runs out or because um, evaluation is not is not available. And so um, if there are any organizations present that work with communities to be patient, provide patient capital, patient fine rising and flexible to adapt to the needs of the communities and and rather than than concessional. So that's that's kind of my ending call for for everyone listening. Thank you very much, uh, Paola. And last but not least, uh, if the connection allows it, I would like to leave the floor to Naomi and George for a very short final remark. Well, I, I apologize. Um, we were aware of this uh, little uh, technical issues and uh, we thanks the audience uh, for uh, the patience with this little technical hiccup. Um, well, uh, it's uh, then my duty to say just a, a very, very uh, quick uh, wrap up. Uh, I would like to start by thanking our panelists, of course, Joseph Kimani, Paola Sevilla, uh, Nunez, Naomi, uh, Flomo, George Gle, and of course, our keynote speaker, uh, Suheili Farzana, for this bright, uh, optimistic, uh, grounded in reality observation. I think we have learned a lot on how to proceed realistically and highly motivated in this uh, uh, in building of cities uh, with all for all. Um, of course, many thanks to Equally for hosting our conversation today. We have two final invitations for you. Uh, the next one, um, the first one is uh, the next episode of the Daring Cities uh, event taking place next Thursday, August 29 at 4 p.m. Central European Summit time uh, with this uh, very uh, inspiring title, No One Left Behind, Equity Focus Tool for an Inclusive Transition. And the second invitation is the next webinar of the uh, Urban Innovation to Achieve Just and Sustainable City Series scheduled for Tuesday, September 24th at 1 p.m. Uh, Central European time, focusing on leaving no women and no one behind in sustainable urban uh, development. You have the links uh, uh, to both registrations in the chat. Uh, also in the chat, you will find the link to join the Sustainable Urban Development Community Group on Capacity for Development platform. This is a knowledge sharing platform created by the European Commission to connect the development professionals around the world. And this group is, a, is really a space to continue our conversation, to share interesting examples, tools, and events. We will be posting updates on our sessions, and we are very happy for you to uh, use this space uh, as an opportunity to share your resources and uh, connect with your peers. Uh, that is all for today. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for your participation. Goodbye and take care. <laughs>